But you know, sometimes that special lady can't make it, so you have to bring her. <laughs> kind of woman, when you dial the phone, the phone knows it's going to be a bad day. It's like, shit, 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 Please don't be there. My friends are making me call. Please don't be there. Hello? Oh, God. What are you doing? Nothing. You know better. I can't believe you asked me out. No one's asked me out in a long time because they say I drink too much and cause problems and fights and stuff. But I don't. When I go out with a man, a man has a point of view. Well, I do too. But it takes me six or seven kamikazes to get to my point of view. But once I get to, I have to ramble and talk and talk about my life, where my dream's going to take me, where I'm headed, what I want to accomplish, where I'm going to go. Hey, do you get any pot? No, I only got a hundred bucks. Fuck, I don't want you hungry. Shit. Ladies and gentlemen, Adolescent boys and girls, welcome to another edition, an erotic edition of Nick's Nonfiction. I'm your host, comic Nick Munez. Today on the show, we have Valentine's edition, Steven Landsberg, economist, bestseller, more sex is safer sex. Every chapter in this book is an assault on your common sense. We are reviving your facts and logic. Get owned, libtard, as Ben Sharpio would say. Steven Landberg is a libertarian self-identified taking a third-party position. One chapter, he says how to fix the government in one move. He says give everybody two votes, one in your district, one in another. And we'll play that out in another chapter. He's saying Scrooge McDuck. Or just the Scrooge from the Christmas Carol. I like the duck character better. That miser was doing more for his community than these philanthropists who are just giving supreme swag to hobos. That's not going to teach a man to fish. you got to set up the market for these people. Landberg is an economist. As we're saying, he predicts the future. He reads the trends. He knows these inconvenient truth studies that say we're going to be underwater in 10 years, Al Gore, aren't always true predictive models. And why is that? Oprah's going since the 90s. One in four of you are going to have AIDS underneath your chair. There's the science behind that we're going to take a deeper look at today. Elephant hunting. You would think if they banned elephant hunting, then the population would thrive. Wrong. You got to keep the population in check. You're probably uh, snuggled up to your loved one, too. It's the Valentine's Day edition, so we're going to be getting sexy. Tuned into the whip clip next week. That's when we're going to be talking about relationships and um, <laughs> abusive ones as well, that you might be signed into one, a social contract. And I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about birth, you and your nation. Are you an abusive relationship? <laughs> Do they tell you what you can wear, when you can work, and when to leave the house? We'll be discussing that next week. This one, I am reviving common sense. About the author Steven Landsberg, he was born in 1954, making him a 66-year-old chap. He's an American, a Yankee chap. He's um, in the retirement home now, swinging, probably slinging a lot of old Viagra dick. He went to the University of Rochester. He was from upstate New York. Then he went to get his master in mathematics mathematics at the University of Chicago, where he cooked with Walter White until 1979. He took a 10-year hiatus after that. He was the professor of economics at the University of <laughs> Virginity. I'll clean it up. I'm sorry, people. University of Virginity of Rochester. 1989 to 1995, and then taught at CSU for some time. Go Buffs. Then a columnist for Slate Magazine until 2006. He wrote about NFL salary caps. He's doing his own Moneyball type of Michael Lewis books that we've had here, an economist who writes great stories. He is more traditional nonfiction we've got today. It's going to be a total orgy of facts for valentine's day that's what i'm into (laughs) he talked about k theory and these relative cycles i'm not gonna act like i know what it is he's wearing 
he's like a mage and he knows what chaos magic is and he can cast spells on them and lead him back to his bedroom like Neil Strauss. We've got another one of his books coming up next month. Stay tight. More sex today. He's been published by Washington Post, New York Times. He went viral over an article called Nationalism is Racism. So he's acting woke. He's going, this thing is racist. So everyone on the left loves him. And then he's talking about how nationalism is um, not a good thing. If you're relying on daddy's paper check, you want to be able to work your own fix. So he's taking a third line approach playing both sides. That's a very crafty headline. In 2008, Landsberg wrote, Can you outsmart an economist? Maybe we'll read that one in the future. It's a bit of a longer show today with 12 chapters. First ones up front are going to be a tad bit longer. Then we'll speed up towards the tail end. As always, chapter one, more sex is safer sex. So it's been about a year since the two weeks to flatten the curve. And we really should be not having recreational sex. If you do, then you are the reaper of grandmothers. You should be put in an insane asylum for wanting to feel some dopamine from human contact. Well, AIDS, if you think about that scare from the 90s, that must have been the super enemy. And so AIDS is something that really shook good Christian moms to their core. And it scared even girls in the 90s. They were saying they didn't want to sleep around because of AIDS. Landsberg starts us out with a story about Martin and Joan. They work together, and Martin is this classic guy. He's got his 401k set up. He sees an ad on the subway. It's about AIDS, and he gets scared, so he stops going out on the town to try to pick up women. And then Joan, she is still going out trying to meet her husband, and she contracts AIDS from some smooth guy in a leather jacket and so now martin who works with this one girl joan and then sees these aids advertisements is like holy shit i'm withdrawing from sex entirely i'm gonna be a sexual chaste hermit and now (laughs) only girls are left to have sex with the aids men's listen i'm giving steve landsberg a full defense of his ideas this is how we do the books He's referencing a study from Cambridge. They did a nurse Cambridge, a test between the ages of 18 to 45, people who had fewer than 2.5 sexual partners a year. What's the point five? <laughs> you could contract things from oral sex, so if you're not counting that, it's the old poop hole loophole for the Christian girls. <laughs> He said AIDS went down when people had more than three partners. It's something about your vetting process. You become better. And I would liken it to, if you've ever seen the famous movie Kids, you think it's going to be a movie about kids in (laughs) Manhattan in the 90s, and then the last five minutes they just womp you on the head with the truth, and they're like, this one kid, Telly, yeah, he had AIDS, and all those girls he slept with, he just gave them AIDS. And you're like, oh my god, this was a propaganda poster the whole time, this movie. That didn't help the Landberg argument, but liken it to the war on drugs. If you make having a sexual intercourse legal, it doesn't encourage people to do it. Like, if heroin goes on the market tomorrow, suburban moms aren't just going to pick up a heroin habit. It doesn't bring people out of their way to do it. It just gives it an easier method for the people who are going to to do it. And then there's a market for rehabs, whereas right now you get put in a jail cell and that's your rehab. Towards the later half of the chapter, he's saying Martin, our fictional character, he's got the world in his favor when he goes to the bar. But For some reason, he doesn't put himself out there enough. And we learned this from the game last year. We got to build the knowledge on the show. Some people are fucking and some people ain't. He's going, Martin is going to scare the other norm core people out. It's not until it's a social norm that people are valuing more. (laughs) Like uh, the entire culture would have to flip. People would be cyberpunk world where it's okay to be a slut for then it to be cool to be a virgin again and this is the super reverse double psychology logic that we're going to be trying to work with in today so some sex jokes are going to lighten it up (laughs) towards the end of chapter one he's citing university of chicago economist studies which is supposed to be top economist school in the country 
And they're all about this more sex is safer sex. <laughs> they're going, if you subsidize safe sex, then there becomes... People want to be the millionaires of virginity. <laughs> they came up with a funny program where if you turned in your used condoms and got paid for that, it's more of an incentive than to just go get free condoms at Planned Parenthood that don't pay much. You should have to show up to the sheriff's office the day after Halloween or New Year's Eve after you had a bunch of hookups and you slap your moist snake skins down on the sheriff's desk and go pay up. I just wrangled all these condom skins last night. <laughs> or we're going to start a merch line for Nick's nonfiction. I'm going to make belts out of used condoms. <laughs> See, we're going to incentivize safe sex here. He's setting up for the rest of the chapters how we need to reverse the incentives to the individual, not on this societal make a scare movie like kids from the 90s, you're going to get AIDS. No, just make it cool to have sex in a safe way. Chapter 2 be fruitful and multiply this one is about ted baxter and merely tyler moore the anchor man who wanted to have six kids and they were big in the news always going we want one of our children to have the to solve the population issue <laughs> and you're the one who's having six kids it's a little hypocritical it's a logical fallacy how people think that more kids solve issues it's more people from different uteruses or different exchanges or combinations of DNA. As humans, we live on diversity. This is the main thing about the chapter. You go into famously the people on the farm who are providing food for everyone in the cities and have eight kids aren't the ones who are making the theory of everything like Einstein. Those are the combinations of genetics in the city where people went. The middle part of this chapter is about the industrial revolution and metropolitization. People weren't marrying their cousin, like out in the farmland. So there were these Nikola Tesla. He's half Eastern European, half Canadian. He's got some Haitian in him. And this guy's a genius. He invented free energy and we're using it for laser tech. Let's stay on topic today. We need vibrators with unlimited batteries. I'm sure girls are dying out there as soon as they're about to get off. That's a Valentine's Day nightmare. <laughs> Basically, scientifically, Landsberg says, if you have two kids with two different people, your chances of success are higher than with one dad. So you got to have your one dad and then the guy who's going to give you the <laughs> genetic freak NFL superstar that's hitting you on the side. Ladies, diversify your womb portfolio. That's what Landsberg would say. He's going to be the baby broker. <laughs> if you think about it by generation in the 1920s, People were standing on line for toilet paper during the Great Depression, and now in the 2020s, hobos have iPhones. The entire standard of living goes up over time when more people engage in the market. How come, he said in this chapter, the Catholic churches donate more to uh, food pantries than the EBT program? Our food stamp program doesn't even, it's something like in the billions that Walmart is donating. It wasn't until the 1930s through all of history that it was an expectation to live better than your parents had. And then in the 2030s, we might see a reverse of that. They're saying the millennials are the first generation to are still be living in their parents' basement at 40. Don't know how that's happening. Biggest wealth transfer ever has happened within the past year. Talked a little bit about the ideal birth rate, but we'll get into that into a deeper chapter. Got one of my favorite ones coming up here. Got to diversify the sexes, people. If we're inbreeding, we're going to have a bunch of blind kids who are albinos. They can't grow hair. They live in caves. We don't want that. Chapter 3, what I like about Scrooge. We got no iced water today. It's a bit of a letdown. Scrooge McDuck. This guy was good with money. He cut costs. He didn't turn the light on at any of his franchises. He reused coal. He ate the same meal every day. He was more generous than Gandhi. Andrew Carnegie. That guy was an industrialist too, but you know, he's donating libraries everywhere. Scrooge McDuck was employing hundreds of servants. 
<laughs> money counters, gold coin weighers. Landsberg is saying philanthropists spread their resources to the few, whereas misers evenly distribute where their wealth they see is deserved. So it even gives a little bit more credibility to the dollar. You're saying this is something we value as a culture. Let me give you this dollar rather than rewarding Obama phone. So you could grub hub to a friggin' tent community under a bridge. That is being rewarded by the philanthropists and the hype houses in LA. They give blankets to hobos. He went into the Federal Reserve, which is an entire book on itself, Landsberg. He's saying printing money willy-nilly devalues the entire labor, which, <laughs> yeah, you get to read into the Federal Reserve, everybody. We could spend a long time on that, but think about it. If I have four seashells and we start using it between us as a little trading mechanism, and then you just start going to the beach and picking up random seashells, well, now all the seashells mean nothing. Federal Reserve printed $4 trillion within the past year. What do you think that does to the average price of a Hershey's bar? <laughs> Everything. Inflation. Economics 101 in this chapter. Scrooge McDuck represents the free market. In 1841, Sutter's Mill was popping off during the San Francisco Gold Rush. There were 3 million men in the United States and 300,000 moved out to California. That's 10% of able-bodied men working leaving their shop keeps all of that created those ghost towns was there really any value left in those town if that's where the people left for and since el dorado people have valued gold more than family and small town main street and everything <laughs> almost like the rare earth minerals off of the coasts of africa which ties back into the federal reserve point they pulled us off of the gold standard in the 70s and the 90s pulled us off the oil standard. The only thing backing the world currency right now is the U.S. dollar. A lot of these billionaires, they're storing their gold off of um, the coast, mostly in China now. They have a lot of programs. That's a big indicator of where the wealth is going. We're talking about the 100-year marathon later in the month. That's uh, all into the Chinese-American Cold War that's happening. It's a little lesson to misery versus philanthropy. And over in the CCP, Communist China, they got gulags and re-education camps. I think we'd rather see JCPenney thriving malls here. The argument is that simple. Authoritarianism versus libertarianism. These are the principles of America. Talks about the bank bailouts through the rest of the chapter, just devaluing all of our labor for the bad apples but what did we vote on in uh, Citizens United it said that political action committees are able to donate to politicians the same as people so corporations are people now that's the true meaning of Christmas that's what Scrooge McDuck was there to teach us <laughs> Stephen Landsberg chapter 4 who is the fairest of them all an electrometrician He's one of these people who sits in a laboratory and puts those little sensors on your muscles all day. His name is legendary, William Butler Yeats, Y-E-E-T-S. He studies on the top percentile of good-looking people. He says beautiful women do 5% better than ugly women in life. Isn't that so anti-feminist, sexist? Well, beautiful men do 10% better than ugly guys. Misogyny. The uh, disparage that men have in all of these things, like IQ as well, that's why the prison populations fill up mostly men. Disparity is always bigger. So the women who are rated least attractive are 8% less likely to find a job than a man on average. You're worse from the start. And then better looking men, they get higher salaries, more job offers, better raises. He got brutally honest in this chapter. I have to respect it. He goes for women. An extra 65 pounds can cost 7% of her wages. <laughs> it costs less to not eat food. That's free money, free 7% worth. 
losing 65 pounds is as financially beneficial as a man taking an extra year in college. It's just like the thing on the dating apps. Women are allowed to put a height preference on men, but men can't even put a weight preference on women. It's not equal, obviously, double standards from sex across to the corporate world. And we're talking about corporations are people. This is an analogy I love. Men make the rules of business, and then women make the rules of society. You guys get to decide that I'm not allowed to wear parachute pants and wear nothing. Honestly, no shirt, no shirts. Fuck that. If men got to decide, I'd be walking around with a sock on my penis. You guys get to decide more societally if we're going to comply to the vaccines, to the masks, no, I'm saying. We have to decide as men, we're going to wear the suits. We're monkeys, but we're going to act like businessmen for a little bit. Who's the fairest of them all? William Butler, he eats, says women have the advantage in society, whereas men have the advantage in the workplace. Langston, he was jabbering about how, you know, you'd be happy with a four-day vacation as long as your neighbors only get a two-day vacation. You want to you don't want a boat but as soon as your neighbor gets one now you need a bigger one beauty is something that is inherently valuable i wouldn't take beauty to make someone else uglier false i mean people are like casting spells making voodoo dolls of each other i don't know what let's try to go for it yanks yankston yeet and langston (laughs) i guess it is kind of true even as a manager people just want to hire attractive people when you see someone who the fibonacci sequence has been blessed upon they have equal quadrant length appendages you're like god loves you he blessed you with this body it's not fair i want to be around it i'm closer to the divine entity of the universe now it's magnetism and for some reason this (laughs) not some reason it's humanity we want to see the Monkey with the best curves, the hip-to-waist ratio, waltzing around in a power suit. Our culture obviously values sex. More sex is safer sex, and then we'll procreate hotter people. And then when the alien comes, we'll just be fuckable. We'll be so hot to those big-headed gray aliens, and their long fingers are going to probe us. Let's get to part two of this book. Happy Valentine's Day. How to fix everything. Landsberg taking big old swigs. <laughs> I need some water. Chapter 5. How to fix politics. You have to turn Congress into progress. <laughs> Langsburg says, everybody gets two votes. You get one in your district and one in the district of your choice. This is trite to say, but Why does it matter if I want to vote Republican in California? It always goes blue. Same thing for Texas going red. Same thing for Jersey going blue. Unless you're in a swing state, why does it even matter to vote? So this entire chapter combats the Electoral College. Guys in wigs, writing with feathers, wrote this in the 1700s while they were drunk. I'm not going to be very good at defending this, being a child from the year 2000 with a phone in my hand. How about we just say where I want my taxes to go in a little pie chart. I could play Candy Crush. Let me slide my fucking social security benefits. You know, it could be so much better than the Constitution hanging up for Nicolas Cage to steal. He talked about Nordic countries. They've updated their system. They do ranked choice voting, which is you give the candidate you really want to see three points, and then the second guy, to obviously 2-1, If you think the third party really doesn't have a chance of winning, you can still give them the three points, so a little bit bigger of a boost, and then the two are to who you would settle for. It just gives more parties more of a chance, a little more fair. (laughs) You know, they don't even let third parties into the debates anymore, so the entire narrative has been controlled. How to fix politics. Maybe some more free speech, just like freeing up the market. We were talking about, we just mentioned diversity in cities well you've heard about the marketplace of ideas that's america baby i can put out my idea on books and you can put out yours 
Whoever the best ideas win, the cream rises to the top. Stop with the socialism. And Americans fuck. Not anymore, maybe, but what's... We were known for sex. Rock and roll, baby. What are we doing to the culture here? We're turning into e-girls and e-boys simping, addicted to incest porn. What the hell is going on? There isn't going to be parents in 20 years. There's only going to be OnlyFans girls. And you're going to be raised... <laughs> be breastfed online. I saw at the airport that they have breastfeeding chambers now. Those should be free sex chambers. If we're talking about fixing politics, how to fix everything, this part of the book is called. Put in Google Pods for napping for couples to have sex anywhere they want. That'll release tension, make traveling a little bit better. He talked about subsidies, so he's saying get the money out of politics again. Like the founding fathers, they these people had a revolution over a two percent tax, and we talk about millions and millions of dollars for the Department of Butt Plugs. You know these people. He said McDonald's is getting funded millions of dollars. I did an entire show about that. Go listen to Fast Food Nation. It makes no sense where we are sending this money to. And from the beginning of this chapter, my tirade. Why don't we get to say where the money's going? Because it has to bomb people in the Middle East. The most free market I say is GNC when it comes to this subsidizing food and all that crap. They don't get a say of what goes into the supplements at GNC. And if we're talking about laying pipe down, you can get shredded at GNC and put down the pile driver, fellas. You know what I'm saying? You, you need some endurance in the bedroom. Need to know how to do the double, double rub clit shake warm up. Oh yeah, all the tricks at GNC. You can get a friggin' take some pre-workout and get creatine condoms over there. If we let unregulated companies, GNC survived the pandemic. They never closed their doors. (laughs) I don't know what all this regulation is for. I mean, the FDA, if we keep listening to them... We're going to be eating fake meat sludge from the goo men. (laughs) Jeff Bezos is going to be, you know, all that soy shit. Men are going to be growing tits. Everyone's going to be trans. I am going to have to be buying a nice baby back rib from GNC. That's going to be the front of the black market. (laughs) Great benefits. Take your fish oil out there. How to fix politics. Get a boner. Fuck these uh, vampires up there. Let's move to the next one. Who cares about politics? It's 2021. There is no earth anymore. There's no truth. There's no politics. Chapter 6. (laughs) 6. How to fix the justice system. 1991. We got some riots going on in New York City. And a guy amidst these irrelevant riots was stabbing people apparently, and then he got acquitted 12 years later because of a reverse DNA exoneration. This chapter is about the justice system, and think about the middle of a riot. In the middle of the chaos, a man can get imprisoned falsely, and if anything shows us about more technology like DNA exonerations are going to show us that false imprisonments are the worst thing to ever happen. I've mentioned it, but you got to go back and listen to Albert Camus' The Stranger. We'll have the Myth of Sisyphus on the show this year. He talks about, uh, my man died today, or maybe yesterday. I do not know. The guy was in prison because they thought he killed a man on the beach who was about to stab him, just like this guy in the middle of the riot. We briefly talked about in that book how When people pay their jurors, there is a system in other countries they have where it's not like (laughs) summoning you to the courthouse where you're not allowed to go work for a few days and make money. You have to get sucked into these murders and have to stay at a hotel. Why don't we have people doing this professionally? And then you got unbiased people, people who don't know how to use logic, deciding whether or not you are guilty for shooting an Arab man on the beach. The Bayesian reasoning is a theme in the most scientific books you will read. I read Sean Carroll's The Big Picture. This is like, uh, who's the wheelchair man? Stephen Hawking's 
theory of everything. These guys, they just talk about statistical probabilities. You need to intake knowledge and have prior experience use Bayesian reasoning to uh, properly adjudicate a courtroom, <laughs> which... It's clown world. There is no logic. I don't know why I try to be so rational and make these arguments. How to fix the justice system. Our current system, it's like a real estate. Jail cells need to be filled by nonviolent offenders. What is a victimless crime? Two people doing something, but a guy in a blue suit didn't like it, so he caught them. Caught, in quotations. In the system of private prisons, it's better to have five different muggers come into the prison and do one year than to have one burglar, a burglary, he wore a mask, broke into a house while someone was in it. <gasps> Terror. Put him in for five years. We don't really care about that. That guy's going to get exonerated. He's going to get the best lawyer because it's a high profile case. But like little time muggers, purse snatchers from grannies tie them up in the legal system five different guys it's like mcdonald's that's five different customers and once you sell a customer once it's likely they're gonna sell it again if you get a dui once those people usually have multiple doys in criminal justice we called it recidivism <laughs> it's a word that should be talked about more the system is more about creating repeat customers we're good at this. We do throughput in America. Let's get these prisoners in and out. Make more jumpsuits. H&M line. I would wear those old, uh... <laughs> you look like a mime. The black and white horizontally striped prison uniforms. Black and white is the new orange. Chapter 7. How to fix everything else. Wrapping up this segment of the book, Act 2. How to fix everything. He is an oracle, the all-knowing Stephen Langsberg. The patent system is apparently where we start, and it is bullshit. As a self-identify, I'm an independent, but libertarian philosophy is almost flawless. The patent system, you get to own ideas, and then if you don't have enough money to renew it, the government now owns your idea by forfeiture <laughs> how can you own you know intellectual property and this is bold coming from me who was doing stand-up you joke thieves are the biggest thing in the you know clubs don't work those people we are cultural social animals word gets around man you don't want to have someone who is stealing someone else's patents a thomas edison in your uh publishing house or whatever i lived by edison new jersey i used to go to his factory that shit was dope he had the dream machine would wake him up in the middle of the night he was probably having a wet dream he was on the edge happy valentine's day tesla made all of that shit and with time i guarantee nikola tesla's name gets bigger than edison the fraud hack thief fixing everything else you know intellectual property would be a good start he threw in gun safety it's kind of pertinent. How come states with open carry are safer than Chicago, where they have shot spotter technology on every corner? You're not allowed to have a weapon. Oh, well, now only the criminals have bazookas. Laws? <laughs> We're really going to talk about the criminal justice system. <sighs> are only there for that puritanical aids the social influence that's what laws are there for because criminals don't adhere adhere to laws what's the speed limit even there for to make the police department money but think about that when you go to sleep tonight some good cognitive dissonance for you hmm, the laws aren't working guns are outlawed but i still hear gunshots on mlk boulevard it's because people do have love in their hearts. That's the real happy February Cupid Day. We are not that animalistic, chaotic anarchy of creatures. If there really was a free society, people would just be trying to help each other's business and we would punish. There would be knights of the night, some sort of community watch that you would like to see trolling around with an AR. A 50 cal Humvee. When you see that in your neighborhood, you feel safe rather than Big Brother coming in for martial law. Talked about the organ shortage a little bit too. 
<laughs> how to fix everything. But why are you checking off the organ donor box? I'm going to be a good person. That's good money. I'm going to come up with an app. The when I die, give all the proceeds of my organs to my kids. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're letting go to the hospital. If you learned anything from flu deaths, it's that hospitals make money when they get to tell the government what people are dying from. So again, they can put it in the news. It's a uh, follow the dollars here. That's how to fix everything. Let's go on to part three, everyday economics. Chapter eight. Oh no, it's a girl. Did you know an American with one daughter is 5% more likely to divorce than somebody with one son? Nobody, not even China, the one child policy wants daughters. With every increased number of daughter after that, the likelihood of divorce jumps up 5%. So I guess the only person that does want more daughters in the world are divorce lawyers. It's a misconception that women are the one who terminate marriages. I don't know how... I've had girlfriends tell me before, I don't care if you cheat on me. But, and imagine if I bought her a house and we had kids and a dog and shit she didn't want to... You know, men are usually the ones that step away from these things once it's deep enough and physically, legally get the government back involved to separate the tie. But I thought the ring on your finger is attached to a vein in your heart. <laughs> Not when it comes to the divorce court. The interesting thing here is that infidelity is equal between men and women. So it's not like men are the ones cheating around, but play out both situations in your head. If the man finds the girl cheating, he's going to dump her. And that's why if there's more women in the world, which it's something like 52 to 48%, then there's going to be more divorce with more daughters. A little bit of a fucking statistical hack he's using for trickery. But who wants a daughter? I think he's just trying to trick us into more men to be analysts at Wall Street. Why do we need more hobos and drug addicts in the world? Again, if we're not diversifying placentas, we're not going to get more geniuses. China had it right. One child policy. China number one. Big stat here too was a girl in her 20s can increase her lifetime earnings by 10%. Lifetime earnings if she puts off having a baby for a year. And then do that again and again, it compounds. Talks about compounding interest with children. He's really putting numerical values on people this chapter. Oh no, it's a girl. Very kind. Let's go to chapter 9. Giving your all. This one was about Moses Maimonides, a middle-aged Jewish philosopher. <laughs> Pretty bad I don't know that or how to say it then. Maimonides, it sounds like boobs. Moses Mamories, he convinced generations of people that it is more beneficial to donate to a charity that you are unsure about. Make it a true lottery. If you look into the Red Cross and even Goodwill, the CEO takes a seven-figure salary there's a lot of overhead in a lot of charities once you start looking into them. And uh, the government, I would say, is the biggest overhead charity program in the world. If we're going to talk about miser versus philanthropy again, except for the philanthropy the government does, is raining bombs on the Middle East. You know, it's not Operation Vittles. Remember that? That was the best use of our taxes during the Cold War. We made it rain candy from the sky in East Berlin. We can't even do one of those to North Korea nowadays. Drop some whoopie pies and fleshlights to celebrate a... Why don't... Do they have Valentine's Day? Is that an international holiday? In countries other than America, they celebrate love every day. Fuck you guys. America's the best. We prove it by the market. We love money more than anything. It's like the hobo thing from before. Giving your all chapter... Why are we just going to give our all to... <laughs> I had this one guy. This has got to be my favorite hobo. His name was Bow-Legged Larry. And I'd walk by him every day. He'd wave hi to me. I'd be driving some days. He'd always ask me for money. And I stopped one day. I was like, Bow-Legged Barry, how are you doing this? Like, 
you, you look like you're pretty clean. You probably have somewhere to live. What kind of money are you making? But like Barry's like, D- are you sure you want to hear? It's like, yeah. But like Barry, you can tell me anything, buddy. He said, I'm making $200 a day. And this is not quite double, but almost that of what I'm making a few years ago. And, you know, but like Barry, a homeless guy, <laughs> didn't quite make me feel the best. <laughs> we are giving our all to people on the corner of the streets. Thank God I never gave this boomerang leg a dollar of my money. In New York City, there's a hobo on every street corner. If they asked you for a dollar, you would be a million dollars short by the end of the day. There are too many people. You need to build up a market. Strive to be Scrooge. Economist Steven Landsberg, not giving his all. Chapter 10, how to read the news. And economic analysis always holds more weight than journalistic interpretation. He's a guy of money. He's not clicking on why SpongeBob is homophobic. You know, he's probably reading the uh, Wall Street Journal. Who is that one? Yeah, Wall Street Journal. They posted an article that said, doing your own science is ascientific. So you need um, truth goggles. What are those called? Hoffman glasses to read the news in today's world, even the Wall Street Journal. And they make you pay $20. How to read the news. We're getting it from a best selling author. He's going journalists. They got to be an independent, truth driven system who is at odds with the bureaucracy. (laughs) They can't be. If you ever watch that old movie, The Post Meryl Streep, Tom Hanks, they're in bed with the government. They got to be like Talleyrand, Napoleon, and the people who stood outside with a guillotine. There were some other guy who used to write hit pieces on them. And you want to catch the emperor with no clothes on. And when we have a corporate media, Rupert Murdoch owning everything, that's not going to make it an easy way to read the news. He's not actually giving you any a way to read the news. He's just saying, let's stop funding it. I'm pulling Landsberg's weight here. Assume the opposite is true. (laughs) Wall Street Journal saying doing your own science makes no sense. Make hypotheses, write them out, try to find a conclusion. How to read the news. He talked about looters in Baghdad, the National Museum, and how that's a whole bunch of propaganda. We'll have this again, a more political show. I don't want to bring that into on this show. Two weeks is going to be the 100-year marathon He came up with some good ideas for the chapter, so you can't bag on Langsburg too much. He said the alcohol tax should be used to treat alcoholism. It goes back to the chapter one relating HIV to safe sex. If we could just use what we're paying for these products to not subsidize the price of gas and Big Macs, but to help people through rehabilitational programs, maybe help them with their addictive personalities and get them on a better track in life. That would be a more lucrative use of our money in the long run. Let's go to chapter 11. We got two more. This one's called Matters of Life and Death. In 2006, the a Dallas newspaper reported on Baylor Medical Center who was discharging someone who was on life support. And the news lied. They say she was given 10 days notice. And on the 11th day, she died within 15 minutes. This isn't a mystery. It's almost like the ventilator thing. Why is the hospital going to pay for this person to be alive anymore if their insurance isn't kicking up? You know, they're going to start running a deficit on this person. It's almost like the Mick hospitals of America are treating us as uh, investors and our bodies are disposable assets. Let's take the positive side, though. You could say the hospital gave this woman uh, 10 days of life, comatosis life with her family. Just try to look for a positive side here. It's a loving week. As a society, we are willing to spend millions on special force teams, weaponized satellites, nuclear submarines, but we can't keep people on life support a couple days. There was a really cool story, really cool, about a guy whose kid got killed in a suburban town because they wouldn't put up a guardrail. It was like around a bend. It would have cost $50,000, they said, 
but if the guy put up the guardrail later then all of the people who spun out onto his lawn before they hit the kid could have been held accountable so they could have retroactively sued him for not protecting other people sooner the average consumer's life in america if we're talking about matters of life and death you go through your lifetime you buy crap from day to day maybe a house it benefits the nation five to ten million dollars then you could count those organs again from before and now you're off to the gates with Landsberg. he was talking about data is infinitely valuable before now you have a cost for human life well then what's the price of terrorism there's one in 300 million chance i get blown up by a bomb that means it's billions of dollars more valuable to not have people watching for bombs at every corner extrapolate this to medical tyranny people please i'm just scared i'm gonna get censored here we're all thinking it this is about safe sex too obviously buy your loved one a sex toy for valentine's day spice it up out there people you don't even have to go to the stores anymore there is no shame why did george bush tell us after 9 11 we need a strong american consumer the more you buy the more you buy into the system this is a matter of life or death here the economy <laughs> you ever seen that meme there's a asteroid hitting earth and it goes this is going to be really bad for the economy chapter 12 the central banker of the soul we're getting metaphysical for our last chapter langsberg he says i don't understand why people lock their refrigerator if you're hungry at midnight a lock isn't going to stop you. How come a rational behavior leads to superstition as a last resort? And this is where he brings up his analogy for the central banker of the soul. <laughs> I guess as the economist and everybody's a scientist now, you know, there's only your mind and your body. <laughs> Nothing else in the universe. We're on a rotating rock in space and then you die. There is no conjectures of souls finding a significant other. You're just a monkey and you're going to die who slung shit at other people for 40 years. That's what science and schools tell you. Me and Steven Langsberg, the anarchist libertarians, are trying to say, you got a soul. And honestly, if you're just donating, throwing a dollar here and there to the homeless guy instead of going to the soup kitchen and feeding them and maybe making a connection to the point where they want to be part of the community and then they turn a new leaf you have a soul man and a lot of the people he probably meets there on wall street are the clauswitz generals of these corporations who have to be taken lives casualties civilian casualties will be had he says revenge is the only debt that is paid with pleasure and we put ourselves in debt to we feel what is worth it and so over your lifetime it's like your soul <laughs> holds all these grudges. That's why they tell you go to therapy, take mushrooms. You'll be able to work through that stuff, forgive. Just go to church, too. You can get these messages anywhere. <laughs> or from the free market, as Langsberg is saying. Beware of gambling addictions. Maybe that's what you're going to fall in love with this Valentine's Day. Through your life, you're going to run these cost-benefit analyses as we did today. He said the person you interact with most throughout the day is your future self. So you're trying to set yourself up for success. Pretty good quote, right? I told you, he's got some hidden truth in there. Langsberg, in the pulpit, he's preaching more. He goes, altruism is wanting someone to be happy. Imperfect altruism is using them towards a happiness that you are familiar with. So central banker of the soul is going to make you feel gross if you're out there using people your entire life. Langsberg said he sees the universe as a pure mathematical expression of fractal equations. When we are all out here just trying to find the truth in the universe. And the most taboo thing you could do is try to put a value on reproductive worth. Which is what he did today in that birth rate chapter. <laughs> Langsberg trying to get you to take a second thought at common sense with this book more sex is safer sex thank you very much buddy happy valentine's day ladies and gentlemen that was a fun edition 
and Valentine's Day spirit ain't totally over. Cue sexy music. In next week's video, we are doing another whip clip for February's edition. It's going to be themed. Maybe I'll be wearing pasties on my nipples. It's over on the Patreon page. We're going to be talking about abusive relationships. I teased it at the beginning of the show. It gets comedic over there. My past relationships too. So maybe we get vulnerable. <laughs> you see my true emotions. You can see my face cringe. My strong, stern backhand it has i'm flexing it right now i've knocked up a couple girls cleaning skills with this damn thing and it's a registered weapon happy valentine's day we're going to be getting woman's month material in next month for the ladies so if you cringed at sex today go have a sloppy 69 stop being such a sad sally my name is nick muniz i will see you guys with a brand new book in two weeks the hundred year marathon 